When most of us think about turbochargers, we tend to associate them with big old diesel trucks, but that's not the case anymore. Today, the OEMs are using turbochargers on a variety of applications, passenger cars and light trucks, and they very rarely fail. But when they do, there's a cause for the failure. And if you don't take the time to identify the cause when you're doing a turbocharger replacement, well, you may just find yourself doing the job twice. Hi, I'm Pete Meyer, and this is Cardone Protect. The Cardone Protect series is produced in partnership with MotorAge, America's oldest trade publication for the automotive professional. While there are almost as many variations in turbo design as there are in engine design, we can focus on our discussion today on two fundamental types, fixed geometry and variable geometry. In both designs, exhaust gases are used to spin a turbine wheel that is connected to a compressor wheel on the intake side of the turbo. As the turbine spins, so does the compressor drawing air in through the intake and forcing more into the engine. More air means that we can add more fuel, and that means more power. A fixed geometry design spins the compressor wheel at the same speed that the turbine wheel is being driven. What varies is the AR ratio, where A stands for the turbine compressor inlet cross-sectional area and R for the radius of the turbo center line to the center of the area A. The AR ratio, that is the area divided by the radius, applies to both the compressor and turbine side of the turbocharger, but the biggest impact on performance is on the turbine side. A small AR ratio will increase the speed of the exhaust gases across the turbine, spinning the compressor at a much faster rate and giving us increased boost at low speed. A problem with the small AR ratio is that it's going to limit total flow through the turbocharger, which is going to impact its performance at higher speeds, limiting boost and peak pressure. A turbo with a large AR ratio will have higher flow characteristics, and that'll help push boost and peak pressures up to the higher RPM ranges. The only drawback there, though, is at low engine speeds, well, the exhaust gases aren't moving as fast as we need them to across the turbine, resulting in turbo lag. To address these issues, the VGT, or variable geometry turbo, was introduced. In these turbos, a mechanism is used to vary the AR ratio in the only way possible, by altering the amount or area of exhaust gas flow reaching the turbine. There are four fundamental designs of the VGT turbo, but the most common in use on passenger car and light truck applications is the adjustable vane or moving wall designs. In the first, there is a set of adjustable vanes that can be electronically controlled and mechanically or vacuum actuated to alter the exhaust gas flow across the turbine. This allows more control over turbine speed, and thus compressor speed. This addresses many of the issues faced by fixed geometry turbos and gives the ECM more control over boost pressure. A common problem with this design is called STS, or sticking turbo syndrome, and it occurs typically on higher mileage engines. It's a result of the vane actuating mechanism freezing in place usually the result of contamination. Soot, carbon, rust are just a few examples. You can help your customers minimize their risk of catching STS by encouraging them to avoid extended periods of steady state driving or over idling. You might also encourage them to occasionally do a little bit of spirited driving, and if the vehicle is equipped with an exhaust brake or jake brake, using that on occasion can also help minimize the risk. The Ford 6-liter Power Stroke had a variation of STS all its own, and that came from a sticking unison ring, the device that operated the adjustable vanes. It could become seized in place, and it was often accompanied by a DTC for an underboost condition. 
The second, or moving wall design, uses a mechanical actuator to move a fixed vane plate in or out, effectively changing the AR ratio. And while actuator problems are common on both designs, it seems to be especially so on vehicles using the Cummins engine. In fact, these models even specify a cleaning of the actuator mechanism as part of the maintenance schedule, a maintenance that's often overlooked. Another common cause of turbocharger failure is excessive exhaust drive pressure, especially on modified engines. This is pressure that's trapped between the turbine and the exhaust valves, and it can reach almost two times the boost pressure being produced. This is very hard on the turbocharger's shaft bearings and thrust bearings. It can also result in excessive pressure in the combustion chamber and a higher chance of head gasket failure. But what are the most common causes of turbocharger failure? Lack of maintenance and poor driving habits. In other words, it's all about educating your customer. Less than 1% of turbocharger failures are a fault of the turbo itself. 90% of the cases, though, are directly related to oil starvation or oil contamination. There are many types of contamination which may be carried by the engine oil into the turbo bearing system and cause damage. The most common contaminant is carbon from the combustion process. Carbon is a very effective abrasive and it will work its way into the turbocharger shaft oil feeds, restricting those feeds and polishing the shaft, increasing bearing clearances until the turbocharger fails. This is usually accompanied by a sharp increase in noise level and oil leaking past the turbine end seal, causing oil to be burned and in vehicles without a particulate filter, noticeable exhaust smoke. Poor driving habits is another major contributor to turbocharger failure. Here are some examples of the things you need to educate your customer about. A vacuum can be created in the turbine when the vehicle is idling for too long a period of time. This can actually cause oil to be drawn past the turbine shaft seal, robbing the shaft bearing from lubrication. Hard accelerations, especially while the engine is cold, can also result in oil starvation to the turbo's bearings. Conversely, not allowing the turbocharger to cool down can result in carbon buildup, affecting the turbo's bearings and causing stiction. And last but certainly not least is really a combination of air filtration and air delivery to the engine. It's important to maintain a clean air filter and a leak-free air delivery system to avoid not only performance problems, but premature wear and tear on the turbo. A dirty air filter can restrict airflow and result in a vacuum on the compressor side, drawing oil past the seal and into the intake. Any loss of sealing on the intake side of the compressor that would allow unfiltered air to enter, that is from the air box all the way through to the compressor side of the turbocharger, is going to allow debris in that's going to damage the compressor wheel. Something you may have heard diesel enthusiasts refer to as dusting a diesel. And sealing is just as important on the other side of the compressor wheel, through the hot air charge pipe, through the intercooler, and then through the cold air charge pipe into the intake manifold. Any loss of seal is going to result in a loss of boost pressure, and that's going to mean a loss of power. And another system to check is the crankcase breather system. When there's a failure in this system, excessive pressure develops, and that can lead to problems with the turbocharger's lubrication. One indicator of this type of failure is the presence of oil in both the compressor housing and turbine housing. If you suspect crankcase failure, a good place to start is by inspecting the engine's crankcase breather. When replacing a turbocharger, be sure to make a close inspection of the old one. Look for signs of damage to both the turbine and compressor wheels. Look also for the presence of oil on either side and check for excessive end play in the shaft. When replacing the turbocharger, always make sure to also replace the oil feed line and inspect the oil drain tube for any problems. Replacing it 
if necessary. Always pre-lube the shaft and rotate the compressor wheel several times by hand prior to initial startup. Make sure that the air filter is clean and the intake is sealed on both sides of the compressor and verify the operation of the crankcase breather system. So the next time you're facing a turbocharger replacement, remember that there's usually a cause for that turbo's failure. Find and correct the cause so your new turbo doesn't suffer the same fate. That'll do it for today's edition of Cardone ProTech. Thanks for watching.